Hello and thanks for joining us uh, again today. Uh, let me start with the usual update on the COVID-19 statistics. I can confirm that an additional 26 positive cases were confirmed yesterday. That represents 0.7% of people who were newly tested yesterday and takes the total number of cases in Scotland to 19,358. A full health board breakdown will be published later as usual, but the provisional information I have is that 13 of the 26 new cases are in the Grampian health board area. A total of 248 patients are currently in hospital with confirmed COVID, which is five more than yesterday, and three people are in intensive care, which is the same number as yesterday. I'm also very pleased to say that yet again in the past 24 hours, no deaths were registered of patients uh, who had tested positive over the previous 28 days, and therefore the number of deaths under that measurement remains uh, 2,491. However, uh, that total, of course, uh, is still a reminder of the dreadful impact that the virus has had, and my condolences again go to everyone who has suffered loss. And as always, let me thank everyone who is still working hard in a variety of different capacities across the country to help us through this pandemic. I have uh, three issues that I want to briefly update on today. Uh, firstly, let me provide some further details about ongoing clusters and outbreaks across the country. Um, I mentioned a moment ago that 13 of the 26 new cases reported uh, for yesterday were in the Grampian area. On the latest figures we have available, a, a total of 380 cases have been identified in the Grampian Health Board area since the 26th of July. Uh, 2007 of these we think are associated with the cluster linked to Aberdeen pubs and 1,050 contacts have now been identified from those 207 cases. In addition, teams are still investigating community clusters in Coatbridge, uh, Lanarkshire and in North East Glasgow. Uh, these clusters, of course, include some uh, young people who go to local schools and, and more detail and information um, about those clusters will be provided as it becomes available. I can also advise today of a cluster in Cooper Angus, which is linked to a Two Sisters food processing plant. Uh, so far, this outbreak has four confirmed cases. However, contact tracing and testing is still ongoing and the plant's owners have closed the facility as part of their work with us to control any outbreak. These clusters obviously show that the virus is still out there and it continues to pose a very real and serious risk. It is highly infectious and once it takes hold, it can spread very rapidly. So all of us have a responsibility in everything we do to try to stop that from happening, which is why we continue to stress the importance of the facts advice, which I will come back to again at the end of my remarks. Uh, these clusters also show the importance of the work being done by our public health teams and our test and protect teams in different parts of the country as they work to identify contacts and trace those contacts and help to contain uh, the outbreaks that have been identified. And I want to take the opportunity again today to thank them for the work they are doing. The second thing I want to highlight today is the publication of our updated testing strategy for this phase of the pandemic. That sets out our current priorities for testing based on the work we have already done to increase capacity and improve availability. As you would expect, our top priority continues to be to test anyone who has symptoms of COVID, a temperature, a new cough or a loss of or change in sense of taste or smell. Anyone who develops these symptoms should book a test immediately through the NHS Inform website. But our sec second priority now is testing contacts of people with COVID and using testing in that way to prevent or minimise uh, new outbreaks of the virus. And the third priority is routine testing of people who work in higher risk environments such as care homes. Uh, we're also using testing to ensure the safe resumption or continuation of NHS services and to assess prevalence of the virus in Scotland. Uh, and finally, the strategy sets out our intention to further increase testing capacity in Scotland. Uh, and that will be increasingly important as we move into the autumn and winter, uh, because in those months, more people uh, will sim have symptoms such as a, a new cold, which might be similar to COVID symptoms. Uh, current weekday capacity in Scotland is for just over 40,000 tests every day. But we want to and are working to increase that to 65,000 tests a day. And we're also continuing to work to improve the accessibility 
of TESS. Uh, overall, the strategy seeks to uh, give a concise and clear explanation of who we're seeking to test, why we are doing so and what our plans in the near future are. The Health Secretary will say a bit more about it in a moment, but it will be available to read on the Scottish Government website uh, this afternoon for anyone who is interested. The final point I want to cover relates to uh, media coverage uh, yesterday and today about care home discharges and particularly the suggestion that in some cases people uh, who were thought to have COVID were discharged from hospitals into care homes. Uh, let me be very clear, as I have been many times before, uh, that proper scrutiny of all uh, and every aspect of our response to COVID, including, of course, in care homes, is really essential. Um, and that scrutiny will uh, and must include consideration of whether, based on what we knew at each stage, the guidance in place was both appropriate and properly implemented. And that, of course, is why we have committed to a public inquiry in due course. However, I want to again be clear also that while there will, will undoubtedly be lessons to learn when a new virus is encountered, and we take that very seriously, care was taken to put guidance in place that was considered to be appropriate at every stage. For example, from mid-March, that included guidance requiring clinical screening of patients being transferred from hospitals to care homes to guard against inappropriate transfer. It also advised social isolation within care homes. However, it is right that all of this is properly scrutinised in the inquiry that will be instructed in due course. Now, I'm about to hand over to the Health Secretary and then to the National Clinical Director, but before I do that, I, I want to end, as always, uh, by stressing the importance of facts. Uh, the clusters I mentioned earlier that we're seeing in different parts of the country really do show how quickly and easily the virus can be transmitted from one person to another. And they demonstrate that all of us need to do everything we can to ensure that we don't give it the chance to spread. We all have a responsibility to each other to continue to suppress it. And all of us can do that by sticking to facts, the five golden rules that we should remember as we go out and about our everyday business. Uh, so these five rules are as follows. Face coverings in enclosed spaces. Avoid crowded places indoors or outdoors. Clean your hands regularly and remember to clean hard surfaces uh, after you have touched them. Uh, two metres distancing remains the overall rule and is really important that everybody remembers that and abides by it. And as I've already mentioned, uh, self-isolate and book a test if you have any of the symptoms of COVID. If we all stick to these five rules uh, as rigidly um, as we possibly can, we will help to deny the virus bridges to travel across from one person to another and from one household to another. Uh, and in that way, we will all do our bit to suppress the virus and help to protect ourselves and each other. So I want to thank everybody uh, who is taking care to do all of this uh, once again for that and encourage uh, all of you to pass that message to everybody else that you know um, and encourage everybody to stick to facts so that we can continue to keep this virus under control. Uh, let me hand now to the Health Secretary to say a few words um, and then I'll hand over, lastly, uh, before questions to the National Clinical Director. Thank you, First Minister. I want to say a few more words about the updated testing strategy that we're publishing today. Our testing strategy must be adaptable to the conditions facing us, to the prevalence of the virus in our communities and in places we know are of higher risk. Using our testing capability now in the most effective way is also part of our planning for winter. The strategy we've published focuses on five key areas of testing. Whole population testing of anyone with symptoms through Test and Protect. Proactive case finding by testing contacts and testing in outbreaks. Protecting the vulnerable and preventing outbreaks in high-risk settings by routine testing and testing for direct patient care to diagnose and treat and to support safe patient care as NHS services restart. Testing is also an important part of surveillance to understand the disease, track its prevalence, understand its transmission and monitor key sectors. So testing is a key tool that gives us vital information about the what, the who and the where of disease transmission. Given where we are now in the pandemic in Scotland, 
our clear priority is to use testing to actively hunt down the virus and to protect those most vulnerable to the greatest harm. Hunting down the virus means using testing to identify those most likely to be infected. At this stage in the pandemic, that includes contacts of confirmed positive cases. Protecting those most vulnerable means routine testing in high-risk settings, including our weekly testing of care home workers, to prevent outbreaks before they occur by detecting positive cases, including from those who may not be displaying symptoms. Our overall pandemic strategy is to suppress the virus, driving the number of cases to the lowest levels possible, and this requires a comprehensive set of public measures. These include real-time intelligence and information, anticipation, prevention, mitigation, and effective response. No one intervention on its own will suffice. And testing is part of that overall response. Testing doesn't directly limit the opportunities of the virus to find bridges to other people in close contact. It doesn't reduce the risk of becoming infected by the virus by touching a contaminated surface. And it doesn't mitigate the risk of being infected from an infectious person. That's why, alongside testings, we constantly emphasise the importance of face coverings, of avoiding crowded places, of cleaning hands and surfaces, of physical distancing and of self-isolation when symptomatic. All of that remains absolutely key as part of all our public health measures, including testing. Thanks, Jean Jason. Thank you, First Minister. The, this morning, the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Nursing Officer and I have written to Scotland's Directors of Education and Children's Services and the Heads of Independent Schools and Grant Aided Schools with a reminder around one particular aspect of the return to schooling across Scotland. The Scottish Government has been informed by our Directors of Public Health about a number of cases of children and young people being in school after recently returning from countries not exempt from quarantine rules. I must remind you that the law requires everyone returning to Scotland from non-exempt countries to self-isolate at home for 14 days. This includes children as well as adults. People self-isolating should not go out to work or to school or visit public areas. This applies to people who normally live in Scotland, who are returning from outside Scotland, as well as to people visiting. These measures apply irrespective of where you enter the United Kingdom. As you will know, the list of exempt countries has been changed in recent days and can change at short notice, with the removal of some countries, including, the France, including France and the Netherlands. These regulations have been put in place to support our continued efforts to suppress the spread of the virus. Scotland's Directors of Education will be speaking to head teachers and heads of early learning and childcare settings today to ensure this is made clear to parents, children and young people. In addition to this, as a result of recent test and protect activity, we are also concerned about people meeting up outside school settings in larger groups. This includes parents gathering at school gates, young people meeting friends without following the guidance on physical distancing. To remind you, the maximum permitted is eight people from three households, including your own, indoors, and 15 people from five households, outdoors. Crucially, everyone 12 and over must physically distance from everyone outside their own household. People are running the risk of spreading the virus to each other, their families and their loved ones. The substantial progress made by all of you in recent months has been as a result of everyone's hard work. Test and Protect is, work Test and Protect is working well, but it cannot suppress the virus on its own. That requires all of our behaviour to keep this pandemic under control. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. We'll move now to questions as usual. Uh, Jamie McIver from BBC Scotland. Good afternoon, First Minister. First of all, can I ask how concerned you are by the increasing number of cases connected to school pupils? And have you any message for any parents who may be anxious about sending their children back to school? Separately, turning to the issue of care homes, how confident are you these 37 transfers from hospital to care homes, which were reported yesterday, were appropriate, or at least appropriate in hindsight? Um, thanks, Jamie. Um, firstly, how concerned I, I, am I? This 
the first part of my answer is not specifically about schools. I am concerned about what appears to be a rising uh, number of cases, albeit that many of these new cases we're seeing are linked to known clusters and outbreaks, but nevertheless, it is a really sharp reminder for us that the, the threat of the virus hasn't gone away. So all of us need to be really, really careful, ultra careful when it comes uh, to abiding by all of the public health advice. Um, clearly though, um, rightly or wrongly, the, the, the concern will be heightened for parents and for young people and for teachers uh, when uh, any of the cases involve uh, young people of school age. Now, let me be very clear that while uh, the clusters uh, that we're referring to in Lanarkshire and North East Glasgow are still under investigation, uh, you know, many of the, the cases that were reported initially were not young people who had been at school, they were just young people who happened to be pupils at particular schools. So we've got to be careful about jumping to conclusions about uh, the, the, the school connection. These are outbreaks that are being uh, described as community outbreaks uh, involving people who are pupils at schools. They are not school-based uh, outbreaks. But that said, we continue to take great care around building our understanding of all of that um, and making sure that the guidance we have in place for schools, which was, as I've said, uh, in recent times uh, was put together with scientific advice and, and input that we keep that under review. And if there are changes we need to make around that, uh, then we do that. And I want parents to be assured, and I think parents uh, should be assured, although if they have concerns, they should raise them uh, with schools, but parents should be assured about the, uh, the, the care being taken around the guidance in place in, in schools. Um, on care homes, again, um, I, I think, and I've tried all along to be uh, very clear that I think all of the decisions we've taken around the handling of this pandemic with a new virus and in unprecedented circumstances, you know, all of these decisions have to be properly scrutinised. And I, I want to be very open to that and not defensive around that. Um, I can't obviously comment on the clinical decisions that are taken in every single uh, discharge from a hospital to a care home, uh, but we have sought at every stage to make sure that appropriate guidance was in place. So the guidance I've referred to already today, which was uh, in place from the 13th of March, uh, had a focus and an emphasis on clinical screening of patients in hospital who were being discharged uh, to care homes to guard against inappropriate um, admission. And then that guidance has developed as our knowledge and understanding of the situation has developed. In, in due course, all of that has to be looked at both for learning, although we try to learn as we go, uh, but also to make sure uh, that what uh, happened is properly considered uh, so that any lessons are learned uh, for the future. Ross Govins from STV. Good afternoon, uh, First Minister. Just uh, following up on, on discharges, uh, will we ever be in a position to know the number of COVID deaths linked to patients who were discharged from hospital into care homes who'd already tested positive for the virus? And would you back calls for a police investigation into the discharging policy? Um, look, it's not for me to uh, speak for uh, the, the, the Crown Office or the police in these matters. It would be entirely inappropriate for me to do so, given uh, my responsibility. What I would say, though, um, and, and I've said before and will say again, is that while I think it's really important, given the nature of what we have been dealing with here and the knowledge and understanding of this virus that we have had at different stages, which has changed and developed at different stages, that we are not defensive about that because we have been dealing here with a, a difficult, challenging and unprecedented situation. But we have sought to ensure that at every stage there was appropriate guidance in place. And I've already covered uh, the aspects of the guidance that was in place on uh, the 13th of March. Um, and that guidance developed and evolved as our knowledge and understanding of the virus developed and evolved and you know our, our testing approach it changed along the way as well and and Scotland is not unique in some of these challenges that we have faced many of the same decisions and judgments and changes in policy it will be reflected in other parts of the UK and indeed no doubt in other parts of the world as well but it re is really important whether it's care homes or perhaps particularly care homes given what we have faced in recent months but but not exclusively in care homes every aspect of how we dealt with this should be properly scrutinised uh, because it is really important uh, that any lessons that, that should be learned are learned and learned properly. In terms of what we will know about different patterns of transmission, uh, we and we've covered this in different contexts before, there is a lot of scientific 
uh, work and effort going in to understand the chains of transmission, genomic sequ sequencing, for example. Uh, so I, I cannot yet uh, say categorically where that kind of work will take us in terms of a, a very granular understanding of, of the chains of transmission of the virus. But suffice to say, we want to develop as full an understanding as science uh, allows us to do. Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, uh, First Minister. Uh, First, First Minister, it uh, took you the best part of a week before you decided to change your mind uh, on moderating uh, the exam results. Uh, Gavin Williamson, uh, the Education Secretary for England, says he's not for turning. Uh, would your advice be to him, you turn now because you'll have to? It's not my place to advise Gavin Williamson. Um, what I can do is set out again briefly, because I've covered this on many different occasions over the past week, uh, the conclusion I um, and the, the Scottish Government reached. Uh, we took uh, decisions with the best of intentions. Uh, having seen the impact of those decisions on young people, we, uh, after considering that carefully, decided that we'd made the wrong judgment and, and arrived at the wrong uh, conclusion. And therefore, we decided it was important to be upfront and open about that, to acknowledge that and to put it right. And that's what we have done uh, through the decision that was announced last week by John Swinney to substitute the, the moderated grades with the, the teacher assessed grades. I think that's the right conclusion that we have reached. Um, you know, I wish I could turn the clock back and reach that earlier, but we did that as quickly um, as, as we could. Um, there are voices, I mean, clearly, uh, Northern Ireland has announced that that's what they're going to do with GCSE results this week. Um, I, I'm not clear they're going to do it with A-level results, but um, that, that's for them to say. There are, appear to be lots of voices um, now in other parts of the UK suggesting that the decision we took in Scotland is the decision that should be followed in other parts of the UK. As I say, it's not for me to advise other parts of the UK. Suffice to say, I think we've taken... Uh, the right decision, uh, albeit uh, after having first taken the wrong one, and perhaps there are lessons there for others to follow if they choose to do so. Alan Smith from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. My question relates to Test and Protect and schools. Radio Clyde has spoken with a parent from Bannerman High, Jim, who is a carer. His six-year son has been asked to self-isolate for two weeks after they got a call last night. Uh, however, his younger son, who's in first year, has been told he can continue uh, going to school. Uh, Jim adds that his wife has asthma, his mother-in-law, uh, who lives with him, has lung disease, and the whole family, they, they, they just don't feel safe. Uh, so Jim's looking for a bit of clarity as to why it's only the, the older son who's been asked to self-isolate and, and essentially the rest of the family can, can go about life as normal. I'll hand over to Jason in a second to say a bit more about some of the decisions that Test and Protect teams take. But Test and Protect uh, teams look very carefully at the, the circumstances of confirmed positive cases. They uh, try to establish who have been what are defined as close contacts and then give appropriate advice. And I, um, standing here as First Minister, I cannot second guess every decision and every piece of advice that experienced uh, specialist test and protect teams are taking, uh, but they are following uh, a well-established uh, process for uh, identifying and tracing contacts and giving advice um, based on the, the risks that they will identify as they uh, speak to identified cases. Now, one of the things in our testing strategy that we are... So uh, up until now, one of the things test and protect... Uh, in individual clusters in different parts of the country will have made judgments about are the extent to which contacts are being tested. As we set out in our testing strategy today, we are now moving to a more routine position of contacts being tested. But these judgments about who is a contact and who is not, uh, we have to allow uh, the, the, the specialist opinion of our test and protect teams to guide uh, all of that. Based on what we know right now, I think test and protect is doing a really good job. Um, but we need to all play our part in trying to stop these clusters um, being uh, started in the first place. Um, and I know how how heightened anxiety will be when we are talking about um, younger people. Um, I happen to my home in Glasgow is in the catchment area of uh, a couple of these schools. So I, you know, my my own neighbours in many respects will uh, be. Uh, 
part of that heightened anxiety. So, but it is really important that we understand what Test and Protect is there to do. Uh, your question illustrates a, a very important uh, point that Test and Protect is not necessarily one size fits all. We have to have conversations with individuals, conversations with families. And if that family in particular remain nervous or unclear in any way, they should recontact Test and Protect and discuss it further. The generic guidance is pretty clear. If you're a positive case, a confirmed positive case, you and your household self-isolate. If you are a contact of a positive case, only you need to self-isolate. That's proportionate. That's based on the nature of this virus and the nature of outbreaks. Now, individual teams, as the First Minister rightly says, can then make choices about what they would do with testing in a factory or testing contacts or how they're going to manage individual outbreaks. But the basic rules are, if you are a positive case, you and the household. If you're a contact, just you. That's the proportionate response. But I repeat, if this family are concerned, and it sounds as though they are, then they should contact Test and Protect and discuss it with the experts in their area. Peter Knight from Global. Thank you, First Minister. You've spoken about some of the positive cases among school pupils not being linked to schools, but surely because it's spreading through teenagers, it could only be a matter of time before that potentially happens. Uh, we've spoken to an S4 pupil who's refusing to go to school without wearing a face covering uh, because he says he just doesn't feel safe. But he says that other pupils are commenting on it and he's facing potential bullying from them. He's told us that the only way to stop that would be making them mandatory among senior pupils. For other industries in Scotland, you've taken a very cautious approach while you say you, you understand the virus a lot bit better because there's a lot still to learn here. Why have you not done that with, with schools? Why have you allowed schools to essentially go back to what was the, the old normal? Um, I, I don't think that is the case that we've uh, allowed schools to go back to the old normal. The guidance that is in place um, around the, the variety of mitigating measures that schools are expected to be in place is, is anything but the old normal. Um, and that guidance has been informed by our scientific advisors. And I've said as recently as the end of last week that we will keep that under review. And part of the guidance uh, makes clear that if young people or, or staff in a school want to wear face coverings, they should be supported uh, and empowered to do that. Um, and whether we should go further and change the advice on face coverings is one of these aspects that we'll keep under review. I, you know, I, I hope I've... Uh, given uh, the very uh, clear indication, because it is absolutely true that we are not complacent about any aspect of this. On, on the contrary, uh, we have been uh, very precautionary in how we have uh, come out of lockdown, for example. So these things are considered very, very carefully. Um, we do know um, that uh, Young and Jason may want to say a bit more about this. That while, again, we're not complacent about this, uh, the, it is thought that young people's uh, role in transmitting the virus is less than older people's. And, you know, if we look at the cases uh, that we have had so far in Scotland, the, the 19,000 or so cases that I've reported today, a very, very small proportion, I think around 1% uh, of, of those have been in the under 15 age group, about 2% in the under 20 age group. Now, again, you know, we're, we're not complacent about that because we know the age profile of cases has been changing. A little bit. So at every stage here, we will seek to be precautionary and give the best possible advice. But I don't want any suggestion, because the guidance in place for schools does not bear this out, that schools are, are, are operating right now the way they would have been operating before in terms of uh, the, the, the hygiene, uh, the, the fact that adults have to remain physically distanced from each other and from young people. Um, through to you know a lot of the work schools have done. I saw some of it uh, at West Calder High myself a week ago today um, are very clearly designed to make sure that all appropriate mitigating steps are being taken. That's it. Uh, schools are in what somebody described to me last week, a teacher described to me last week as the next normal, not, not the new normal. That, that will change over time as we learn more and as the stage of the pandemic adjusts. Schools do not look like they looked before. There is hand sanitizer everywhere. There is a lot of cleaning. Kids are separate from the adults and the adults are physically distanced from each other. We know for certain there is a gradient of infectiousness as you age. It's not an exact nine-year-olds do and 14-year-olds don't or vice versa, but there is definitely a gradient. That makes some sense. It is easier to transmit if you have bad symptoms because you're coughing and sneezing and spluttering. 
And we know for sure that children have a milder course of disease. Many of them have no symptoms at all. It therefore gets harder to spread the virus. Not impossible, but harder. And we also know for certain that children, particularly young children, have a very mild course of the disease in the main. So th that makes sense to therefore, as you reduce the prevalence across the whole nation, you can bring schools back safely. Uh, Fraser Nicholl from Original 106. Thank you, First Minister. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, now that we're a couple of weeks on from the start of the Aberdeen outbreak, I'm wondering how content you are with the number of new cases we're seeing and if that's largely what you'd expect at this stage. And just secondly, if I may, I've just been on the NHS Inform website and it says that coronavirus testing is only reliable if you have symptoms. I'm wondering if there's early, any, 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 sorry, early indications how this new system has been working in the Grampian area since it was rolled out last week? I mean, you'll have heard us say uh, many times over the course of this pandemic that uh, testing is uh, less reliable in people who don't have symptoms and there are windows, um, and Jason can say more about this, when uh, testing is at its optimal uh, effectiveness and efficacy. Uh, so that's something that um, we said many times before, that said, we now do test uh, more groups of patients who don't have symptoms um, on that uh, precautionary basis. Um, how content, to use uh, your word, am I about the situation in Aberdeen? I'm, I'm never going to be content with any cluster or any uh, outbreak of new cases because, you know, we, we have to try and avoid and, and prevent these happening at all. Um, and also, at the start of a cluster of the, the nature and scale of Aberdeen, I think, you know, given that we are still learning about this virus and how it transmits and operates, I, I'm not sure I had a, a defined set of expectations about what we, we would see. I think we do see signs, and it is still too early to be absolutely definitive about this, that the, the, the increase in cases in that cluster um, has decelerated uh, a bit, so it is the, the increase is slowing down, but we will need more time to see whether it is starting to properly uh, reduce in the way we would want it to. Um, and I do think the evidence that we have thus far is that Test and Protect has done a very good job. It has been a big, complex job, uh, but through the, the contacts it has been identifying and tracing, then I think without that, uh, what we would have seen in Aberdeen is much, much more widespread community transmission uh, than has been the case because this has been an outbreak subjected to all of these control measures. Uh, so we will continue to monitor it closely. Uh, we have to review the restrictions again on Wednesday, uh, seven days from uh, the last review. I you know, can't say at this stage that those restrictions will be lifted uh, yet because it may still be just a little bit premature for that. But we continue to, to look very carefully. The incident management team continues to uh, take all appropriate steps, as will happen in any cluster uh, that we're dealing with. We've, we've talked about testing many, many times from these podiums and testing is most reliable when you have some, the test has to find virus. It has to find either active virus or remnants of virus. It is a cotton bud up your nose and down your throat. So it needs to physically find virus or remnants of virus. So therefore, by definition, it is best when you have active virus. And that's pre-symptomatically or symptomatically. That doesn't mean it can't find some asymptomatic people. And that's why we have, over time, expanded our asymptomatic testing. But that group is not as reliable for the present test as the symptomatic people. Aberdeen is behaving, actually, if you look globally, relatively predictably when the behaviours have now changed again. We're seeing 200 or so cases linked to the original outbreak and now numbers of other little clusters that don't have a direct solid line back to the pubs and restaurants of the initial weekend, but connected to individuals. And if you look at the data around the world, that's exactly what people are seeing from this virus. So Aberdeen is behaving very well, and it's doing what it should do, but it takes a few weeks to bend the curve, like we discussed on Friday. I spoke to some Australian colleagues this morning about uh, Victoria and Melbourne, and it's taken them four weeks to see a drop in a big number of cases that they had four weeks ago. Okay, thanks, Jason. Uh, Neil Purin from PA. Thanks, First Minister. On the discharge of uh, positive COVID patients into care homes, uh, you've said you've committed to a public inquiry in due course. Um, there are calls for it to be investigated quite urgently. The Conservatives say they want to see 
the inquiry get underway this week. Is it now time to set a date for when the inquiry will begin or a time frame for when it would get started? We'll continue to consider uh, the timing of that. I, I think and I, I suspect people will understand what I'm about to say here. We, we try to learn lessons as we go. Uh, so we've, we've adapted our approach in care homes as we go and, and cases and, and numbers of deaths in care homes are now at a very low level, although as with any other aspect of this, we can't be complacent about that. Uh, but in terms of a, a more systematic, uh, in-depth look back at everything we did around this, which I think is, is important that that happens, we've got to get the balance between doing that, but also continuing to deal with an ongoing pandemic right. Um, I don't think I would be serving anybody well if I uh, took everybody, whether they're in the, the Scottish Government team or the, the health service or social care or our public health teams across the country, if I took their focus away from dealing with a, a pandemic that we are not through yet into uh, looking back for the purposes of an inquiry. So these are these are fine judgments and, and will always be, be difficult judgments, but I would really continue to stress to people how important it is to remember that we're not through this pandemic. Uh, we, we may not even be halfway through this pandemic. Uh, this virus is still a day-to-day -day threat to us, which is why it's really important and people watching should want me and everybody involved in this response to keep really focused on what we've got to do today and tomorrow and next week. Obviously learning as we go, uh, but don't take our eye off that ball um, in order to uh, become focused on an inquiry. So we'll consider the timing of that, uh, as other governments will be as well, and trying to get that uh, balance right. Uh, Chris Musson from The Sun. Hello, Mr Minister. Um, just on this issue of transfers to care homes, um, you made it clear earlier on there that all hospital patients were clinically screened prior to transfer. Can I check with you or the Health Secretary and perhaps with Professor Leach's clinical director, can, can you give us an example of a, a clinical reason for a hospital patient who is tested positive for COVID being sent to a care home? Just because this is, this is something that might be puzzling some people. Well, just I'll hand over to Jason on the clinical uh, processes around discharge. Uh, but just to be clear, what I said was that the guidance that was in place from the 13th of March uh, advised clinical screening of all discharges from hospital to care homes in order to guard against uh, inappropriate transfer. And, you know, again, I, I would just make quickly the point I've made many times before. We are talking here about older people who had no medical need to be in hospital. So keeping them in hospital, uh, particularly in the face of a, a COVID pandemic, would not necessarily have been the right or proper or, or appropriate uh, thing to, to do. And I'm talking generally they are not about individual patients, but that is the, the guidance that I was referring to there. But Jason might want to say a bit more about the, the clinical processes. Yeah, we've spent 10 years, 12 years in Scotland uh, as one of the global leaders in patient safety, particularly in our hospitals. We understand the nature of the dangers of keeping people in hospital for any longer than they absolutely need to be, particularly our frail elderly. So the advice to clinicians is, is the same during an infectious outbreak of norovirus or during this horrible, horrible virus that we faced in the last few months. There should be a conversation that involves the clinical team in charge, the patient and the family, and the receiving area, forgive the expression, that could be a care home, it could be care at home, it could be a community hospital. And those three sets of individuals have a conversation about what is most appropriate for that individual, based on their clinical condition, on their frailty, on patient and family wishes, and a whole complex set. And we shouldn't, as the government, as the National Clinical Director, I shouldn't second guess those conversations. They are entirely up to those local decision makers. You could have had quite a long time ago a positive case, for example, a positive test, and then subsequently the decision is made by clinicians that the safest place for that patient to go, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic when we were seeing Northern Italy intensive care overwhelmed, when we were expecting huge numbers of cases to overwhelm our National Health Service to move them to somewhere safer with correct guidance. My, my final point is the guidance is not written in isolation by bureaucrats. The guidance is written by clinicians. 
So the guidance is clinically written, clinically decided. So everybody is involved in that before it goes to each sector. Uh, Alistair Grant from the Herald. Uh, hi there, First Minister. Just to continue on that line of questioning, um, do you know if, if all the staff working at these care homes would have been made aware that patients who had tested positive for coronavirus were being discharged into their home? And were you, First Minister, or the Health Secretary, or the Scottish Government in general, aware of these discharges at the time, or more broadly, were you aware that patients who had tested positive for corona coronavirus had been discharged into care homes? And just finally, uh, are you aware, you, or have you been given any indication that there are more cases than the 37 we, we know about from the reports over the weekend? Uh, I think I'm right in saying that major health boards such as NHS Lobby and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde didn't provide the relevant information. I have no uh, further figures than the ones that have been reported. Obviously, we will, uh, if, if that changes, we will make that known. Uh, equally, as, as First Minister, uh, I would not know the clinical uh, circumstances of people who were being discharged from hospital into care homes. That is the process of clinical consideration that uh, Jason has outlined there, nor would I know the detail of all of the, the conversations that, that took place. Uh, we put guidance in place now, one of the things that I will want to make sure is properly scrutinised is whether, based on all of the things we knew at the time, did the guidance we put in place at different stages, was that appropriate? Uh, and obviously then there are questions about was that guidance uh, implemented um, in full at uh, every in, in every circumstance? So, you know, these things deserve to be properly looked at. The point I, I, I make a lot and, and will continue to make is that this was not a situation of people not bothering to think about the circumstances of older people in care homes or going into care homes. A great deal of care uh, and clinical uh, ad advice, as Jason said, went into this guidance to try to get this right at every uh, opportunity. And we have kept all of that under review. So we have changed policy approaches at different times. Um, and that's the approach we will continue to take as we continue to uh, work our way through uh, this pandemic. Jean, I don't know if you want to add anything. I, I think, no, I, I don't think I have much more to add um, to what you've said, First Minister. Uh, what we've tried to do in addition to what the First Minister has said is listen to what uh, the care home sector has said to us about what it needs and when it needs it. So that, for example, was why we responded uh, as early as the 19th of March to make sure that the appropriate, uh, appropriate PPE was in care homes in the volume that they required because the guidance uh, required more use of PPE than in normal course, and their private supply chains were not able to cope with that. So we've attempted, as well as uh, what the First Minister has said and uh, Professor Leach has said, to respond to what the care home sector has said to us at every step of the way. And we will continue to do that with the regular engagement that I have with Scottish Care and with others, including with our colleagues in COSLA. Uh, Scott McNabb from The Scotsman. Um, thank you, um, First Minister. Um, can, can I just go back to um, something Professor Leach said earlier on around the concerns about cases being identified where people have not self-isolated after coming back from abroad? I just wonder if you are concerned that the um, regulations and the um, um, rules are being sufficiently implemented by public health officials around that. And also, uh, if I may, for Professor Leach, given the good news that we've not had any um, deaths where there's been a positive case in, in over a month now, are we at a stage where we can um, put that down to advances in the treatment of patients who are, um, um, for, for example, we've heard about um, dexamethasone, the, the steroid, which has been treating the most unreal patients. Can we say that's had an effect? Is it causing you to maybe reassess the virulence of, of the virus? I'll hand over to Jason. On, well, he, he may want to comment on both these points. Very briefly from me, um, what Jason said earlier on about uh, reinforcing the need for people coming back from countries uh, that are on the quarantine list to make sure they abide by quarantine um, is not necessarily a reflection that the, the regulations are not being uh, properly implemented either by border force or that the checks are not being done by Public Health Scotland. It is more just a reflection of the fact that in every aspect of what we're asking people to do here, ultimately, you know, whether or not we succeed in uh, this advice helping to keep the virus under control comes down to all of us as individuals as to whether we are you know 
complying with quarantine, washing our hands, maintaining distance, wearing face coverings. So it is simply what we do each and every day, which is to say all of us have a big part to play here. So in whatever aspect it is, make sure you know the rules and you're abiding by those rules. Um, Jason's much more uh, qualified than I am, much more qualified than I am to talk about the, the whether there is any change in the, the virulence of, of the virus. Um, what I would say is I, I, I don't think I'll ever be able to find the words to, to convey uh, the sense of relief I feel um, at standing up here day after day now for a month or so and being able to report no deaths. And, and for anybody, families out there who've had people with this virus, that relief will be multiplied many times over. Um, but what I don't want people to take from that um, I do want people to feel relieved because it is a big thing given what we went through earlier in the year. But I don't want people to take from that any sense of complacency that the threat of the virus is gone uh, because it hasn't. And we absolutely have to remain very focused on doing everything that we can to keep it under control if we don't want in months to come those figures, whether it's hospital admissions, ICU admissions or sadly deaths going in the wrong direction again. Two, two points. Your, your first one, we, we have a daily conversation with the Scottish Directors of Public Health. They raise issues that they hear from conversations with Test and Protect, conversations with care home leaders, and they, they raise them, they escalate them to us if they're concerned. And one of the things they raised over the weekend was they were hearing that there were some children and young people in school who perhaps either had misunderstood the quarantine or were not doing the quarantine in some way. So that's why we have emphasised that today. I don't have specific numbers or specific relationship to outbreaks, but it's something we just wanted to emphasise again so parents and carers would understand completely. I'm afraid I can't tell you this virus is less virulent it, for sure. Last week, the world crossed two slightly artificial milestones, but they somehow seem important. 20 million infections and 750,000 deaths. This is like nothing the world has ever seen or known, and that's why we're taking unprecedented measures. What has brought our numbers down is unfortunately not drugs, it is human behaviour. And it is human behaviour that in the medium term is going to keep us where we are. There are better drugs if you get very sick, but they do not stop you getting the disease, and they do not help you if you are sick. They only help you at the real end. And we've not had many of those cases because intensive care hasn't had to take many in. I do worry, still, this is week three of the Aberdeen outbreak, for example, if hospital admissions start to rise in Grampian, we have no treatment for this disease, no good treatment for this disease. So, so human behaviour is how we've suppressed it and how we will continue to suppress it for the foreseeable future. Thanks. All right, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, about an article that Professor Debbie Sridhar wrote for the New York Times, I think it was published over the weekend, um, basically stating that Scotland and Northern Ireland don't have control over their borders. And I, I'm just quoting from the New York Times website, that both now face a stream of incoming infections from England and Wales. Um, I just wondered whether you shared her analysis and also the language she's used, given that has come in for some criticism. Um, and to Professor Leach, what figures do we have uh, on the number of cases that are coming into Scotland from visitors in the rest of the UK? Um, I haven't read uh, directly Davies' uh, article in the, the New York Times, I, I think it was, um, but I know the point she was making because she has made it regularly in the past and it's a point that public health experts the world over uh, will be making, that as we get levels of this virus to uh, very low levels domestically, the biggest risk or a big risk is importation from other countries. That is a, a point that is being made from countries from New Zealand uh, to uh, throughout Europe to, to here in the UK. And, and that is why issues around border control are so important. It's why we have the quarantine regulations when we perceive a risk based on data from another country to be higher than it is domestically. And the most recent example of that, of course, is, is France. So it is a, a really important and really valid and really legitimate public health point that she is making. Um, and I, I do think those who try to read into that 
politics or constitutional arguments are the ones doing a disservice here. Um, I've been very clear all along. I, I will take whatever steps that I think are appropriate to take to protect Scotland from this virus. And if that means having uh, restrictions or controls and people coming into the country, then so be it. And it's got nothing to do with politics or constitutional arguments. It's, you know, why, uh, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but it, periods over the uh, the last few weeks, you know, you've not been able to go from one state in the United States to another uh, without restrictions. It's why people in Melbourne can't travel to other parts of Australia right now or vice versa. It's why different parts of Germany have had restrictions in place at different times. This is a virus and it has to be dealt with on the basis of good, solid public health advice. And I, I really do, I, I just despair of and, and deprecate people who want to politicise these arguments because actually they're doing a real disservice to uh, the people that we're trying so hard to protect. And uh, Divi Schrider's advice uh, to the Scottish Government, she's independent, uh, she's, she's not a, a Scottish-born person, I'm sure, uh, I don't know directly, but I'm pretty sure some of this probably bemuses her. Um, but her advice has been really important and continues to be really important to the Scottish Government and people should be thankful for that. Jason. The, the public health advice about importation is relatively straightforward. Don't, don't take people in from higher infectious areas and allow people in from lower infectious areas. That applies in Aberdeen. So we've, we've restricted travel in Aberdeen because that's a higher risk area just now. And as soon as we possibly can, we will allow travel to happen again. The northwest of England implemented their own travel restrictions on their individuals, and we did the same, and vice versa. And you saw the cross-border cluster in Dumfries and Galloway where we did exactly the same. I don't have the exact numbers of how many positive cases have come from other parts of the country. I know that local incident management teams look very closely to try and backwards trace, because we want to know where infections are coming from so that in the round we can make choices we can advise the ministers about Spain or about France or about wherever else things are happening. But that could be, forgive me, that could be Gretna, it could be Aberdeen, or it could be Manchester. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Mail. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I think just to return to your answers on uh, care homes, I think a lot of members of the public will be quite surprised to hear from your previous answers that not only do we not know exactly how many people who had tested positive were transferred from hospitals to care homes, but, but also you don't seem to know. We're several months down the line now. Why, why do you not have a clear picture of exactly what went on and how can we expect lessons to be learned if you if you still don't have that, that clear picture? Does, does that not make the case for quite an urgent inquiry so that we can prepare for a, a second wave if, if there is one? What, what I said was I didn't have any uh, different number to the one that had been reported. We, in all sorts of different ways, and remember we're dealing here with a a virus that has been difficult to track in different ways. We're, we're trying through a number of scientific approaches as well as public health approaches to understand as far as we can in this uh, work will, we, will continue the different chains of, of transmission so that we can look back and adapt as we go forward uh, policies and approaches that we have taken. So, uh, you know, th that work will uh, continue. In terms of lessons learned, we have, you, you can see from the changes in approach that we have taken, uh, we're talking here about care homes, but this will be true in other uh, areas as well, the ways in which we have changed our approach, whether that is in, in testing or uh, other aspects of inf infection prevention and control as our knowledge and understanding of the virus and how it transmits um, has developed. And I, I, again, I, you know, I, I am the last person uh, that will ever stand here and be complacent about any aspect of this. But we know that we have, through the different approaches we've taken in, in care homes, got to a situation now where the numbers of new cases in care homes is very low um, and the number of people dying uh, from COVID in care homes is very low. Now that will partly uh, reflect lower prevalence in the community, but it will also be a reflection of the approaches and the policies and the guidance uh, and the different interventions that are in place. So last week, um, if I'm uh, not getting this number uh, wrong, if the, the National Records of Scotland weekly publication in the previous week, only two people um, in care homes had died. Now, 
any death is one too many, so I'm not trying to minimise that at all. Uh, but the, the evidence through what we've done in the position we're in right now um, is there. And as is the case in every aspect of how we're dealing with this as we go forward, which is why the testing strategy we're publishing today is so important, because as we face next phases of this pandemic, which... You know, there is a degree of uncertainty how they will develop. We have to be as prepared as possible for that. And, you know, the Scottish Government with our partners um, across health and social care uh, continue to work very hard on doing exactly that. Uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, just to follow up on what Michael just asked. I would expect the onward destination of a hospital patient who tested positive for coronavirus to be routinely recorded. Um, NHS Greater Glasgow, Scotland's largest health board, has said that the, it's too expensive for them to tell us this information. Are you content with that answer? And um, will you give a commitment that an inquiry um, will conclude or at least publish interim findings before the Scottish Parliament election in May? Um, if I was to stand here right now and dictate the time scales, once an inquiry is up and running, to dictate the time scales of that, you or your colleagues would no doubt pretty quickly accuse me of trying to uh, sort of curtail or direct uh, what an inquiry under the Inquiries Act, which I would presume uh, would be the basis for um, an inquiry to take place, the, the inquiry is independent and, and that is in terms of uh, within its remit what the inquiry looks at as well as the timescale. I, what I would absolutely say and I, you know, I, I continue to stand here every day and I, I continue to answer questions to the best of my ability based on what we know and based on what we are learning. Um, you know, this is unlike anything any of us ever dealt with and for me it is, I have no interest, um, whatever the, the, the consequences of this might be, I have no interest in anything other than making sure we properly scrutinise and properly learn lessons around this. Uh, because I know how uh, awful this pandemic has been. And while I, I hope with everything I've got, it's not in my lifetime or our lifetimes, the world undoubtedly at some point will face another pandemic. So there is absolute determination on my part that this is properly scrutinised. But equally, I've got to also be aware of my responsibility to continue to focus uh, very, very hard on dealing with the pandemic today, tomorrow, next week and next month, because we are not out of it yet. Um, and that's a, a responsibility I take uh, seriously on a, a daily basis. And I think people would expect me to, to maintain a, a focus on. Um, on the first part of your question, I, I have nothing to add to what I've said uh, there. We, of course, will continue to discuss uh, with Greater Glasgow and Clyde the response that they gave to that particular um, question. Derek Keeley from The Courier. Thank you, First Minister. On the Costa and Angus, are you able to say at this stage whether the virus may have been spread to the area from one of the other clusters, or do you have any idea where it may, may have came from? As you mentioned last week, the work was ongoing to see if there was any link between the cases in Aberdeen and Orkney. Is there any update on that at this stage? Um, I don't know yet. Um, because these things are, are still under investigation with the Cooper Angus uh, outbreak, whether there's any links. Um, and I will make sure we get you an update on the, the Orkney IMT has been uh, putting out updates, but in terms of what some of the linkages are there, I'll make sure that we give you um, a proper update on that. But with the Cooper Angus one in particular, this is very early uh, days and we need to allow the uh, incident management team to, to look in more detail. The, the most important piece of tracing, remember, is forwards tracing to try and interrupt the chains of transmission. The backwards tracing, which you seek, is, is, is done in slightly slower time because it's not quite as important as catching the viral cases now, the contacts and self-isolating them. So the priority is always to go forwards from the case rather than backwards, although we do want to know where the virus has come from, but we don't need to know it today. What we need to know today is the contacts and get them self-isolated so we stop that virus spreading. Many thanks. Uh, that concludes the questions uh, for today. Thanks to those who have uh, joined us to ask them. Thanks to uh, Jean and Jason and to Jill, our BSL interpreter for the day. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us as usual. Please um, continue to abide by the facts, advice, face coverings, avoid crowded places, uh, clean your hands and hard surfaces regularly, two metres distancing and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. 
Um, and please share that advice with everybody you know um, to make sure that it is disseminated as widely as possible so that as many people as possible are familiar with it and therefore encouraged to abide by it. Ultimately, uh, defeating this virus comes down to each and every one of us doing all of the right things. So uh, I'm asking everybody to continue to do that, however uh, difficult I know it is on a daily basis. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you again tomorrow at the usual time.